Hey there, welcome to the YouTube channel. I pray that this message encourages you and it helps you grow and become more like Jesus. And make sure you hit the subscribe button so you can continue to grow and learn more. Enjoy. You can turn to Ephesians chapter 4. We made it. We made it to chapter 4. This next portion of scripture, Paul turns from this mind-stretching theology concerning what God has already done for us and through us in Christ to focusing on what believers are to be and what they are to do as children of God. So Paul is transitioning and it's from the, the theology, the depth, and the beliefs to now the practical living action of believers. A key word in the next three chapters of, of this letter is the word walk. It comes up, some argue seven times, some say eight times, depending on what word you, uh, you define in the Greek. I believe it's eight times the word is used uh, in Ephesians, and depending on what translation you use as well. The word walk, meaning to walk out who we are in Christ. So there's legs now to our faith. And it's important because what we believe determines how we behave. What we believe to be true will determine how we live. It's often that way in our lives. Proper theology Proper understanding of God promotes proper living. Now, why did I say promote? Because it promotes it, but it doesn't mean we decide to do it. We have to decide to live out the truth of God's word. So proper theology promotes it. It, it inspires us to live the right way. But in the end, Paul understands, and I have learned to understand as well, that it's up to me whether I live it out. Now, in the New Testament time, the word belief was much more than intellectual understanding. To Jesus, belief meant to conform your life to him. So to believe in Jesus wasn't just to believe that he is alive, but it was to believe in such a way that everything he says is true and I should live it out. So that's different. And when he called his disciples to believe in him, he was calling them to live a certain way, not just have a certain way of thinking. So the thinking should turn to action. So we're going to read. Now, here's the thing. Uh, Ephesians 4, 1 through 16 is all about the unity in the body of Christ. And the reason why Paul brings this up, again, is because he talked about how Jesus has united Jews and Gentiles together in Ephesians 1 through 3. But he never said how we should behave. So now he connects the two books together. And he even has a, a bridge verse. But I want to read it first to you. Ephesians chapter 4, 1 through 6. But 1 through 16 is all one portion of scripture as well. And if you want to, you can look at it this way. That Ephesians 4, 1 through 16 has four ways that we remain in unity as the body of of Christ. Today we're going to cover only two of those, and we're going to read Ephesians 4, 1 through 16. It says this, I'm sorry, 1 through 6. Therefore, I, a prisoner for serving the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of your calling. I have it on the screen for you. For you have been called by God. Think about that for a moment. It's not, it's not Paul saying you should live this way. God has called you to live this way. That holds a different weight, doesn't it? It's not Pastor Ryan saying you need to do this. It's God saying do this. But he's begging them to. He's, he's, he knows it's so important. He's pleading with them, imploring of them. Verse 2, always be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other making allowance for each other's faults because of your love. Make every effort to keep yourselves united in the spirit 
binding yourselves together with peace. For there is one body and one spirit, just as you have been called to one glorious hope for the future. There is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all, in all, and living through all. Amen. Isn't that rich? That's a rich text. Well, there's a bridge verse here. The bridge of Ephesians 1 through 3 in chapters 4 through 6 is Ephesians 4, 1. It says, Therefore I, a prisoner for serving the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of your calling, for you have been called by God. This is an important scripture, an important bridge. The word to uh, walk in the Greek is used for lead a life worthy, depending on your translation. This is a New Living Translation. The NIV will use walk. Others will use walk. Um, I believe, actually, NIV doesn't use walk now. Lead a life worthy. Walk worthily, in other words, of your calling. What does that mean? In the Greek, it's an action verb. To change the manner, to be changed by the manner of your living, to be characterized by the character of Jesus Christ. It also has this idea of progressively moving forward and growing and maturing in Jesus Christ. So he wants us to walk forward away from that salvation experience was amazing. But we don't get that transaction and go, okay, I'm good. He's saying we walk forward and now live because of what Christ has done for us. We live the way Christ would want us to live. Very simple. And I, I have to tell you, um, the next three chapters of this book are very confrontive. Uh, the Bible has a way of offending you. And as the world's wickedness increases, it just gets more offensive. Just so you know, I, I needed to say that today. God gave me that last night before I couldn't sleep, and, and God gave me that. You need to know that the word of God is offensive. Um, not, it's not trying to be offensive. It's just as the world moves away from what is true and holy and righteous, it will appear offensive. But to God, it's normal. To God, holy living is natural. To God, holy living is exactly what he intended in the first place. It was man that distorted it. As the world's wickedness increases today, the scripture will bother people. You won't like it. I read it sometimes and don't like what it says about me. And then I go, but here's the thing, the doctor... Everyone loves the doctor, right? If the doctor says, if you continue this way, you will die soon. Or you will die in early, at an early age, a younger age. Is that hate? Or is that love trying to save you? It's love. God tells us the truth and warns us out of love. And Paul loves this church so much, he loves he loves the people he's poured into, he's lived with, and he's willing to sacrifice his life just like Jesus did for all of us. He's willing to sacrifice his life for the church. He has no qualms, no worries, to be really honest. And in the next three chapters, he is going to confront the church and say, do not go down these ways. Do not live this way. Why? Well, let me give you a verse that, that wrecked my life one day. 1 John 2, 6, those who say they live in God should live their lives as Jesus did. That connects to the next word that's so important in our verse, and it has to do with worthy. And lead a life worthy of your calling. The word worthy in the Greek means axios, and it has to do with the balancing of the scales. And you can have all these beliefs, but then not live the proper character or standard. And so Paul's saying, balance out the scales Live a life that is consistent with the call. God called you to be his child, so live like a child of God. And he gives us right away in the first 
few verses of chapter 4, he instructs us. He's like, do they match? Does your life match what God has done for you? Uh, Personally, I want to live a life worthy of the call God had on my life for three reasons. Let me give you the, the, all three. I'm going to start with the one that I, really hits me every time, is I am grateful. Why do, I, why do I want to live a life worthy, holy, and matching the standard of the word of God in Jesus Christ? Why would I want to live like Jesus? I am grateful. I know how great my sin is. I know how much debt I was in, and yet it was all paid for by Jesus Christ. Isn't that all of us? Secondly, I, I strive to walk out a life worthy of the calling on my life, the calling to be a child of God. Okay, we're not talking about calling into ministry. He's just talking about every day, how you should live. Because secondly, the only suitable response for saving my life is surrendering it to God so he can use it for his glory. So I'm grateful but now I've given my life for God's service, okay? Every single one of us can do that, whether you're in full-time ministry, part-time, volunteering, or never will be in any kind of form of ministry, whether your ministry is home. How many of you know your kids are a ministry? How many of you know your neighbors are a ministry? Praise God. The only suitable response, church, is to give our lives because he gave his. And thirdly, I just want to represent God well. He calls me his child. I want to make sure his name isn't tarnished, but that I represent him well, right? That I don't give a bad name to my father. Instead, I honor him for all he's done for me. He has an amazing reputation. Let's not tarnish it. Those are the three reasons why I'm motivated to walk out my faith worthy and, and consistent with what God has done for me. Now, Ephesians 4, 2 through 6, uh, goes into preser- preserving our unity. Uh, a key word in this next paragraph that we're going to read is, is keep or keeping. Uh, we've been brought into unity with one another through Christ. Uh, we don't create unity. Now, that's important to understand. We don't create the unity in the body of Christ. Jesus bled and died to create that unity. What we do is we preserve it, we keep it by, well, getting along, loving each other. And so Paul goes into that. And so we're going to answer the question, how do we preserve or keep our unity. And, and he answers it uh, right away. We show the grace of God to one another, verses 2 through 3. It says in Ephesians 4, 2 through 3, always be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other. Make an allowance for each other's faults because of your love. Make every effort to keep yourselves united in the spirit, binding yourselves together with peace. Be humble um, and, and by the way, in common terms, Paul is saying, would you get along? Get along. Love each other. Care for one another. Okay? Now, humility is someone who is not proud, doesn't have a high or haughty view of oneself. To be humble is to have a realistic view of oneself that you are not perfect. But it also means to do what Christ would do. And Christ served. He didn't just come to He didn't come to be served. Doesn't that what the scripture says? He says, serve. And so Jesus modeled how we should be humble as well. He's the king of kings, the Lord of lords, the king of the universe. And he came down and humbled himself. And he washed Judas's feet. That always messes me up. Man, he showed them how to do it. He served Be gentle, also known as meekness in the Bible. Some would say meekness is weakness, but it's actually bridled strength. Strength under 
self-control. A believer who is gentle has learned to master oneself and keep it under control. The other way would be to respond and react brashly. But Paul here is saying, show gentleness with one another. How about be patient? And he connects another one, love, and bear with, it, with one another in love or to make an allowance for each other's faults. Okay, in other words, expect those around us to not be perfect, but in love. Love covers over what? A multitude of sins, the scripture says. In other words, forgive one another when we hurt each other. Be patient. Uh, another word in the Bible used for this or in other translations, long-suffering. To be able to endure something that's not right and, and to just keep going, to endure discomfort without fighting back. Doesn't that go against our nature? Oh, I want to be right, and I want to make sure everyone knows how right I am. Ooh. But he says, be patient. Be patient with one another. Because of love, make allowance, show some grace, some, some forbearance. Have you ever had to put up with someone at work for a long time? It really tests you, doesn't it? And then he goes in to say, by making every effort. In the Greek, the idea is to actually work at keeping peace. It doesn't happen accidentally. Peace happens because we put work into it. What does that mean? Um, actively making sure you don't cause conflict. But when conflict arises, you also work at not letting it destroy the unity in the church. So you can work at keeping peace by treating people with dignity and respect and love, gentleness, patience, kindness, all the fruits of the Spirit is what Paul is talking about here. But then when a conflict arises, maybe it's in your marriage, Maybe it's in a small group. Maybe it's in serving opportunity here. Whatever it may be, do we work at also fixing the conflict? Or do we let it fester and grow bitter and hurt our view of our brother and sister in Christ? He's saying make every effort. I want to tell you something. According to this verse, it says, make every effort to keep yourselves united in the spirit binding yourself together with peace. Make every effort to keep yourselves united in the spirit. Uh, unity is spiritual, not just physical in Christianity. Why am I saying that? Because often uh, our spiritual growth is tied to unity. And Paul goes into that later on in this chapter, the maturity that we need to have. But unity is always connected uh, I mean, sorry, uh, unity and, and behavior is always spiritual in, in God's world because it's his spirit that should be coming out of us, not our flesh. And so when there's conflict with someone in your workplace or your home or a neighbor, you need to know something. It's tied to spiritual life too, not just physical. Remember, the devil, is, he's tricky. He's trying to divide us. He's trying to mess things up in the church. Okay? It's always spiritual. Because here's why, too. You have an opportunity to grow spiritually in those moments. And God allows these moments to happen to see. It's a test. To see what you would do with that test. So be, yes, be careful to to dig deep and go, this is spiritual. I need to grow. I need to approach this with the help of the Holy Spirit. And then peace. The word peace, I don't want to leave that out. Here's what we know. Diplomacy and peace between countries, it takes work, doesn't it? It takes ambassadors. It takes people working together. Unity and peace in marriages take work. I've been married 15 years. 
Isn't that crazy? That's a long time. Already. Some of you have been married 50 plus years. You're like, you have no idea yet. <laughs> it takes work. I can't haphazardly just make sure my marriage is strong. I got to put some work into it. I got to love. I got to care. Unity and harmony in friendships take work. Unity and peace in the church, obviously then, it also takes work. And I want you to know that some will throw that desire of unity and peace right out the window. Why? Because the desire to be right overcomes the desire to be in unity and peace. Often when I deal with conflict in the church or in marriages or in friendships, even in workplaces, I say this to everyone I, I coach on, on this and disciple on. When you have to be the one that is right, that is when everything goes wrong. Every single fight my wife and I got into, when I had to be right, that's when everything went wrong. And the best thing to do is for both sides to actually practice verse 2 of Ephesians 4. Be humble. Be gentle. Be patient. Have long-suffering. Make every effort to have peace and unity. Not every effort to be right. That's not what Paul said. That's not what the Word says. And the same thing translates into the church. So let me help apply some of these verses the absence of these qualities may jeopardize Christian unity. These traits are found in Christ, and Paul's desire in this letter is that we grow into the fullness of Christ. We not only have Jesus as our example, but Jesus dwells in us through his Holy Spirit. So his Spirit, the fruits of the Spirit, Galatians 5, 16 says this. It talks about that we, that we can't practice the fruit of the Spirit if we're not in step or in unity, or in cooperation with the Holy Spirit living in us. So he has united all of us. He has put the Spirit in us. And so now we must learn to live the Spirit out in these ways. It takes the grace of God in and flowing through us to keep and preserve unity. It took the grace of God to fix us and save us. It obviously would take the grace of God to keep unity, wouldn't it? A perfect example of the importance of these grace attributes is when a new believer comes into the family of God and they still have a little edge to them. You know what I mean? They're still a little rough around the edges. Thankfully, the church understands the seasoned Christians and believers, we understand to bear with, to be patient with the new believer. Amen? But we seasoned members of the church family we're not off the hook because we're not perfect either. We can become callous, tired, run low on patience over time. I'm preaching to myself. We can forget what we were like when we first came to Christ. We can forget that we still need Jesus. I love that communion reminds me every time we do it. Every Sunday, every day, every time I read his word, I'm reminded I still need Jesus. It's in those moments where we dig into the deep well of our relationship with God and with humility, remember that we are not perfect. The same patience and grace that God is showing us, we must show to all believers in the fellowship in the church. This scripture implies something important too. It implies fellowship. It implies connection. It implies closeness. Paul was talking to a church who would eat together regularly in their homes, who would work together on the same street, and who would worship together in the same synagogue or place of worship. And he knew that they would get close. And after a while, we get on each other's nerves. But it was a great opportunity for the Spirit of God to grow in us, for, for 
for us to grow into, sorry, the Spirit of God. And I say sorry because the Holy Spirit doesn't need to grow. We need to grow. We grow into the likeness. Jesus is the head. The body should grow and mature to match Jesus. And so that's a great task. On Sunday mornings, it's hard to practice that. We don't have a lot of time here. This context was definitely not meant for an American church for an hour and 15, hour and 20 minute sermon, depending on how long Pastor Ryan preaches. This scripture wasn't intended, it wasn't thinking of this. This scripture was referring to the times you're close with other believers. But we do need to practice patience and grace in this room, don't we? And then when we're serving along with one another and we volunteer, volunteer this uh, every week and, and sometimes volunteering can be a thankless job. And sometimes it's scary to, it, it's scary to be up here. I appreciate the grace that you show me, uh, you know, whenever I make a mistake or, or say something accidentally or whatever it may be. It's, it's not easy to lead worship, you know, every week. And it's not easy to serve every week um, in positions around people. We, we have to show each other grace. We really do. And then the more we get, the closer we get together, the more we hang out together, the more we have to show as well. So I'm going to turn now to the next portion of Scripture. And, and Paul, he just can't help himself. He loves the depth of God's Word. He loves the depth and the theology of God, and he gets into it. And the second way we preserve unity, the first one was we show grace to one another. The second way is we stay rooted in the grounds of our unity in other words, the foundational doctrines and beliefs, we must stay rooted in them. In other words, remember them, okay? Hold on to them. And Paul takes a moment to do that. Remember that we have been united by Jesus. It's not just that. There's seven things that make us one in just this scripture, and there's, there's probably more. But Paul focuses on seven for there is one body, one spirit, just as you've been called to one glorious hope for the future. There is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all. Seven ones. First, before he mentions body, church, on purpose, because the theme in the first 16 verses is unity in the body of Christ. And so... He's saying one body. What's he talking about there? He's talking about the body of Christ, the church. Paul loves that analogy, that the church is like a body all connected, Jesus as the head. There's one spirit. He's talking about the Holy Spirit here, the person of the spirit, the Trinity. We all have the Holy Spirit in us as true believers. Ephesians 4.3 he says, keep the unity in the spirit. Then he goes into one glorious hope. What is that? He's referring to the return of Jesus Christ. The one glorious hope of his return and everything that's wrong is going to be made right. And I can't wait for that. Can't wait for that. For the future. There is one Lord. Now this, this one, this one, hmm. Lord has to do with leader, master, okay? So when we say Jesus is our Lord and Savior, we're saying that he, we submit to him, that he has an authority. By the way, he's the greatest Lord, the most gracious Lord. When there's lords in the world and they don't treat people right, that's, you know, that's not Jesus. He's Lord Leader, Matt, he's so kind about it. I mean, think about it. He, he, he washed Judas' feet. I think he has some patience for people. That's our Lord. Now, Warren Wiersbe, he says this, it is difficult to believe that two believers can claim to obey the same Lord and yet not be able to walk together in unity. That hurts because <laughs> that's true. What has to happen there 
if, if we don't submit to the word of God, we don't submit to the life of Christ, we don't submit to the teachings of Jesus, if there's disunity. But when we all say Jesus is Lord, that means that in the end, Jesus gets the final say. And what Jesus says to do is better than what you think I should do or what I think you should do. It's what Jesus thinks. And he wants us to stay in unity. One faith, meaning the Christian faith, faith in God for salvation, faith in the good news, it's the Christian faith. There's no other way of looking at this word, but the faith that Jesus has established. The Bible says without faith, no one will see God. He's talking about that faith. Faith in God. One baptism. Scholars go back and forth whether this is a spiritual baptism of Acts 2 or whether it's a water baptism. Uh, most scholars believe it's the water baptism of Jesus Christ. When, we, when they baptize him in the name of Father, Son, Holy Spirit, when we are baptized and on May 2nd, we're going to be doing water baptisms here. When you are baptized, there's a unity be, with you in Christ. You're, you're saying, I'm, sh I'm um, sharing this experience. It's a shared experience with Christ. When you go underwater, it's the burial of Jesus Christ. When you come out of water, it signifies the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Right? When we do that, we're identifying with Christ that we too have died to our old life where all the sin was. And when we come out of that water, we're a new person in God's eyes. It also means that we will live like that new person. We will strive to walk in that new way. Right? But it also means that we are baptized into the family of God. How did they know that someone was part of the family of God? How did they know if someone was part of the church? They water baptized them. So when you get water baptized, it's to signify that you are now part of the church and now you live with Christ and with one another. That's why we really can't be Christians and live isolated. We are part of the body. We are one in the spirit, one in faith, Glorious hope, baptism. And lastly, like he didn't need all of that, he could have just said this one. Paul says, one God and Father of all. God unites us all. The entire world of Christians, there's over two point some billion Christians in the world today. The latest statistic. All the Christians in the world. What unites us is that God is in us and over all of us. Praise God for that. Well, that is seven very foundational and powerful reasons to remain in unity. And I want to say something strong today. Is that cool? I've already been doing that. I'm just going to keep going. To let discord and conflict win means we've had to turn our back on those seven things. And they're not even things. They're beings. They're God. They're seven foundational doctrines of the church. It's God. In other words, to let conflict and disunity win is to turn our back on this. Now, I'm not, I know that situations are complex. I know that there's so many stories and there's so many different variables and things. I know that sometimes, some, sometimes two people just can't be in the same room. I get that. But to leave with hate or to leave with unforgiveness is not biblical. At least, if you're not going to be in the same room, at least let there be peace. Now, here's the thing about God. <sighs> Ooh, this one's hard. I get this asked, people ask me, I get emails about this and everything. Because the reconciliation of God is that you can be in such close unity with God again that he lives in you. That same idea is that you should be able to be in the same room again with those people you had conflict with. And that's not easy. I know from experience. And I know that when that anxiety rises up when you're around those people, you know? I know that, I know that feeling. But the only thing that helps me is to go, that's my brother or sister in Christ. God loves her or him 
in them just as much as he loves me. The cross, he bled on that cross just as much for them as he did for me. He didn't show me more love. Mm. So between the traits of grace, we show each other in verses 2 through 3. Or, yeah, 2 through 3. And the spiritual grounds and foundation of our unity through verses 4 through 6. It should be extremely hard for disunity to win. It really should. Amen. I don't want to end on a sour note. But I will say this, a lot of disunity is winning in the church way too much. I mean, I'll just be completely transparent with you. I think it's wrong how many different denominations we have. Jesus unites us. The gospel of Jesus Christ, one faith, one spirit, one baptism. And I get it, some denominations exist because they don't agree with some of the things we agree. I, I, I understand that we're in a fellowship. Some people call us a denomination. We are in a fellowship of the Assemblies of God. And there's disagreements that people have with our views of Scripture. But in the end, we all believe in this. There might be some variations on those things, but we need to get along. For, this, for the glory of God and for the sake of the lost, who are really confused. Amen. They're confused by us. So let me wrap it up with this. Let me wrap it up with this. Our daily living should be a grateful and careful expression of honor to God for all he has done for us. Live a life worthy of the calling of God. Oh, God, help us to do that. God, help us to be careful, intentional. Help us, God, to do that. Secondly, keeping unity requires us to walk in step with the grace and spirit of God. When things get rough, when things get a little edgy with one another. Both parties need to go to God and say, God, help me to do what is right in your eyes. Because that's how I walk worthy of the calling. Not what I want, but what you want, God. And then lastly, what makes us one is more powerful than what tries to divide us. Those seven doctrinal, foundational grounds that we are rooted in, one body, Thank God, one spirit, one church, one baptism, one faith, one Lord, one God. That is more powerful than any force that will come against this church. That is more powerful. Amen. And it is so important that we operate by the power and in the power of the Holy Spirit so that is a reality for all those who are watching the church of Jesus Christ. Amen. I'm going to close this in prayer and then Dorothy would be out here to share a few things. Thank you church for being such an amazing church. Hungry for the word. Thank you. God, we, we love you. We thank you for your word today. Lord, we thank you for the richness and the depth of it. But also now you're challenging us to live it out. We need your help with that. And you've given us the help of your Holy Spirit. The same power that raised Christ from the dead lives in us. We thank you for that. We can do this. We can walk this out. You wouldn't call us to it if you didn't equip us for it. We thank you for that. Lord, unite us in these days that we're living in. God, help us to be careful and respectful for what you've done for us on the cross. Lord, and I pray that, God, we would work at living at peace with one another, that we would do everything, make every effort. God, we love you. We trust the needs that are in this room with you, everyone online. Those we prayed for earlier, God, move by your power and your spirit, Lord Jesus. We love you, God. We thank you and praise you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Love you, church.